Hello, my name's Craig Moore. I write about tanks, I research about tanks. And when I'm at museums like this, I bring my uh, tape measure, measuring equipment to look at armour, to check facts and figures. I'm a writer and editor for Tanks Encyclopedia and also the Tank Hunter website. I've also written a couple of books. I've been asked to come down to give you my top five tanks. This is number five on my list. It's the Coventer tank. David Fletcher on his five worst tanks included the Coventer tank. He's 100% correct. It was a badly designed uh, tank. The engine compartment was too small. They had to put the radiator in the front. And of course the radiator could be damaged easily. So they had to put these armored covers on the front. If you visit the uh, tank museum at Bovington and have a look at the Coventer, check out the tracks. They're different, they're different sizes. This one is wider. This track was used on the Mark III and the Mark IV. The track on the other side is slightly smaller and that was used on the Mark I and the Mark II versions of the Coventer tank. The reason why I've chosen this tank to be part of my list was a personal connection. I was very honored to be uh, allowed to be part of the dig team by Rick Wedlock um, back in 2017. We went down to the uh, pit. This tank had already been uh, dug up, uh, but the other tank had been left there. And we removed all the chalk and we were able to uh, dig out the tank. And what was lucky was one side was still in a good condition. The wheels went, the suspension was going up and down, but the other side of the tank had been used for satchel bombs. The troops have been trained how to knock out tanks with uh, mines and grenades, put into satchels, into the trench, into the tracks. And as the track went round, they would explode and knock out uh, the wheels, damage the wheels, and also damage the track. We already had, or Rick already had, a turret which he'd rescued from the uh, firing ranges, and the uh, tank was recovered, and it's now in Manchester undergoing a restoration. Hopefully, in, be able to be in a driving condition and you might be able to see it driving around the track at Tankfest. So, this is the Coventer tank. This is my number five. And I really had a great time digging uh, its sister up in Dorking. This is the Buffalo, number four on my list. Now, it will surprise some of you why I've included this amphibious vehicle on my, uh, as my number four. It's because of a personal link. My uncle Arthur Moore was one of the troops that on the uh, 13th of April at 10.30 p.m. got into the back of a buffalo with around about 30 to 40 other soldiers. They crossed the River Isle and they uh, made a bridgehead on the other side. This enabled a pontoon bridge to be built over the river. At nine o'clock, the Canadians moved through their position with tanks and they advanced into the town center and there's lots of street fighting. 24 hours later, my uncle was in the town square. Arnhem had been liberated. It's not something that you find in many history books. David Fletcher has done a fantastic tank chat on this vehicle. I recommend you have a look at that on YouTube. This is the medium mark A Whippet tank. It's a World War I tank. For the past year, I've been involved in a secret project, researching in the archives, uh, diagrams, plans, maps of deployment and uh, photographs because um, Dr. Tony Cook and Kevin Jepson are going to build a life-size uh, version of this tank. It will be drivable and hopefully it will appear in Tank Fest, driving around the arena and other military um, vehicle events. But I just want to show you a few other little points that I've learned. Well, what they, um, they did on the tracks, they had grousers, track extenders, teeth. What they were was metal boxes with a wooden rectangular uh, lump of wood on the top. They would be clamped to the wood, so when it was uh, to the track, so when it was stuck in the mud, it would have a bigger tooth and hopefully get itself out of trouble. When not in use, they were attached 
to these metal straps, these bands on the side here. And also at the back of the tank, you can see a metal band underneath the exhaust. This was more of the safer position to put them on if they were in the battlefield. If you visit and look carefully here, you will see that there's an indentation in the bodywork. What happened was that on both sides, there were metal structures that came out and there was a storage box on the back here. You see this lip here? That was uh, to support part of the storage box. And there's one on that side and the metal strap would go up to the top. The other thing that's not visible was that here, you can see an indentation and there's one at the front of the tank. A big bit of metal would come out here. Now most tanks have tank guards, not the Whippet. The Whippet is the first tank ever to have a canvas mud guard. But on this track, let me show you a couple of other features. As you can see here, it's got mud chutes. Rather than have a build up of mud at the end and cause problems, the mud in theory would come down these chutes. But the sloped armour give an added layer of protection for the uh, chassis hull. You might also notice it looks very similar to the World War II Matilda II tank layout, the track layout. It also had this type of mud chute. The reason I chose the Mark V instead of the Mark IV British World War I tank was because of the innovations that happened. This was the tank that went to the end of the war. The main thing was it had a new engine and a new gearbox and, and steering system, which enabled one man to drive the tank. On the Mark IV, you had to have four, peop four people to drive the tank. There's other improvements as well. If you can see at the top, the unditching beam now has a spring system so that the uh, unditching beam can be released inside the tank. One of the easiest ways of telling between the Mark IV, the Mark I and the Mark V tank is to look for this grill. The Mark V's had this air intake grill. The only problem was they found going through the uh, mud or the battlefield, the mud was coming off here and also water was coming off here and getting sucked in to the engine system and the cooling system. So what they came up with initially, they had one louvered cover here to stop it, but they found that wasn't enough. So they then did two louvered covers, but still the mud and the water was getting into the um, air intake. So eventually what they did was an inverted V that covered over the air intake. The most effective form of communication on the battlefield from the tank was by pigeon. Each tank had two, three, four pigeons given to it, and each time they reached an objective, they would send off a pigeon to headquarters. Uh, if they were ditched, they would send off a pigeon. But on the Mark V, they introduced semaphore. Uh, so the commander, now being relieved of his driving uh, requirements, had the um, cabin at the back, and there was a semaphore tower, so he could send messages out. Here are a few things you might not have noticed on the Mark V. This bit of metal here, this is a bullet stopper, a splash guard to help protect the driver and the co-driver in here. What would happen is bullets were hitting the uh, glacius plate, shattering and going up the slope into the vision ports. This L-shaped bit of metal was stopping the bullets going up. Have you ever wondered why there's a gap here? It's not present on the uh, Mark I tank, but it is on the Mark IV and the Mark V. The reason why the gap was there was that there was a, a vision of making the tracks wider. It never happened on the Mark V or the Mark IV. But in the museum, there is the Mark IX tank and it has the wider tracks that were destined to going here, but never happened. The two other little features I want to point out. Over here, there are two holes. That was for fixing the um, headlights, uh, down pointing headlights. But there's this little thing here. This should be like that. That was so that the fascine could be uh, strapped down onto the top of the tank and it was a hook to hold down the uh, uh, cable or the chains. 
If you look under the tank, there's a circular hole with an armoured cover. That's a pistol port, so when the tank is going over the trenches, if needs to, needs to be, they can slide the armour back and shoot directly down into the trench. So number two was the Mark V World War I British tank. Now this is my number one choice. It's hidden behind the screen. It's not the DD tank. It is the Sherman in British service, armed with a standard 75 millimeter gun. Why? I have a family connection with this tank, which I'd like to uh, talk to you about. The Sherman was with the tank with my uncle lost his leg. He was involved in Operation Totalize. This was the advance from Caen down to Falaise. The problem with uh, previous attacks was that they were done over open far, uh, field, fields and farmland. The Germans had the advantage that their guns, the 88 and the high velocity 75 mm guns, could fire at a longer range than the British tanks. To over, do, overcome this advantage, they decided to do a night attack. This was the first armoured night attack um, of the war. It was relatively successful. At 3 a.m. in the morning, my uncle's uh, regiment, the 144th Royal Armoured Corps, they were waiting for the infantry, the Highlanders, to catch up with them and carry through and attack the village of Cransmill. At 3.20 a.m. there was a huge explosion and my uncle's tank got hit with what we believed to be a Panzerfaust. That was a handheld bazooka, uh, but used by the German infantry. My uncle was the only one to get out. He was badly burnt, his leg was a mess, everybody else in the tank died. His main concern when he was out trying to get the, uh, out of the tank, rolling around trying to get the flames out, was that he wasn't bayoneted by some Scottish infantry guy as he was screaming in pain because their instructions were to anything out of the armoured vehicle was the enemy and to uh, shoot it or bayonet it. All he could uh, think about was saying the password and he wasn't quite sure that would work. So he started yelling abuse at them uh, about their Scottish heritage, about the men wearing kilts. And uh, luckily that worked because all he got was a kick and uh, called Sassanak and uh, off they went, but he survived. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed my five choices. I know they're a bit unusual, but each one was either connected to my family or a research project that I'm involved in. Please remember to subscribe to the Tank Museum's YouTube channel and also support them by becoming a member of Patreon so they can carry on the great work that they already do. Thank you very much.